Okay, we're into our last speaker of the day. Welcome, students. Um, our last speaker, by request, is asked to have a short introduction. So, uh, this is Craig Allen. Allen, uh, Craig has uh, worked uh, in a, as a place-based field ecologist for the U.S. Department of Interior since 1986, co-located with land managers at Bandelier National Monument in the of northern New Mexico. Thank you, Paul. And thanks, Larissa and Megan and Robbie and anyway, everybody. Um, pleasure to be here. So <clears throat> this was the promise title, the ongoing promise and emerging perils of Western forest restoration in a global change world. But after I worked on it for a little bit and after Tony's talk yesterday, I thought of, a, of another title potentially, the convergence of restoration and adaptation to resilify Western forests in a global change world. By global change, what am I talking about? Well, there's a number of different processes that are affecting uh, the planet ecologically, affecting ecosystems all over the planet, including Western forests. Um, this talk's gonna focus particularly on the effects of warming temperatures interacting with drought and the, the amplifying effect these have on various disturbance processes that we've heard a lot about, fire, insects, tree mortality. Um, and the likelihood, we're starting to see in some places in the likelihood into the future, get based on, on particularly warming projections of, of major changes in ecosystems and species distributions, and relating that back, then back to what does this mean for restoration? So and I'm gonna do that in the context of where I've, what I know best, which is the world here in the south end of the Rockies in the southwest, uh, the mountains. Here's the Rio Grande Valley, and I've been based here in this part of the world for a long time. Uh, did both my master's and PhD work in this part of the world, actually in this mountain range, um, the Hamas, and it's been a, my sort of privilege as well as a pleasure to be able to spend a career in a place and, and learn a place and, and the relationships with the place, but the people as well. Working with land managers, that's been a big part of my job. Um, so it's kind of um, the stories of landscape change, and, and that's what I've studied, is historically landscape change and then been documenting it, because uh, it's been happening um, sort of in front of my eyes. You just sort of had to be awake. Um, it's part of the world, the Southwest, where there's been an immense amount of development, in part because tree rings, but other, other sources of, of paleo data as well. There, the stories we know, um, uh, it's a part of the world where, where these kind of high frequency, low severity fire systems were, were a large fraction of the landscape and the kind of changes that, that uh, Paul certainly described in detail uh, this morning, both at the stand scale and the landscape scale homogenization. Um, there have been predictions, I mean, all the way back to Leopold in 24, uh, classic uh, in Journal of Forestry, grass brush, timber and fire, weaver in the early 40s, Cooper 1960. You didn't need a crystal ball when I arrived in the early 80s to see that the next time there was a major drought episode, the risk of, of fire based on just the stand structures could be high. And since 96, when things turned dry, we've been seeing that. Um, I'll describe that a little bit more, but in terms of one of the managerial responses to that in that time period was restoration by management uh, using, using means that we know, uh, mechanically fire as tools to reset forest structures back toward, uh, toward historical reference conditions. There was a lot of historical reference condition information for this part of the world. Um, one of the, a really good example of, of a Arguably a success for this has been the, the Santa Fe Municipal Watershed. This is the Santa Fe River. It heads up here over 12,000 feet near the Santa Fe Ski Basin. The city is down here. This watershed, it was actually closed to the public. It's mostly Forest Service land in the 30s by the Forest Service to try to protect that water supply. Two major reservoirs. It's about 40% of the city's water supply these days. Um, but sort of a classic story. There was work done, uh, fire scars, age structure looking along this major elevational gradient at, at the, the, the history of, of, of fire as a process and how that affected the, the demography and the stand structures. Uh, some of the work was published. Ellis was the lead on this, Ellis uh, Margolis. Uh, big collaborative effort, money put into it by the congressional delegation. Um, 
because uh, Santa Fe got worried after some big fires in the late 90s, finally got them to take it serious, and they implemented. So for the last 15 years, there's been implementation um, in the lower half of the watershed, combinations of, of, of uh, mechanical and fire. And in the lower half, they've, um, it's been relatively secure, and the maintenance of this is actually being supported by the public of Santa Fe through a surcharge in their water bill. So it's a sort of a classic example where the communities that bought into this, they built it, they built the, <laughs> they built the trust needed to pull this off. And if you can do this in Santa Fe, I mean, smoke is still an issue. They're still burning up there. I mean, the water, cold air drainage takes it right down into the heart of the city. Um, it's not still painless, but it, it works. If you can do it here, you can do it in a lot of places if there's the will. Um, there are still issues. The upper half of the watershed is in designated wilderness, the Pecos Wilderness, and uh, different return intervals, it's, and it's due, overdue. 1685, the upper half of this part, was the last stand-replacing fire event, so um, it can happen. Um, so ranging from things like that to, as people have mentioned, Region 3, Arizona and New Mexico, there's a lot of wildland fire use, resource benefit kind of fires. Um, a classic example of that would be in the Gila, where the Forest Service, since really arguably into the late 70s, has been letting fire work in the big wilderness landscape. Um, with some success of places where multiple fires have been occurring, withstanding uh, more recent uh, fire events. So, so there's part of the ongoing promise that um, uh, is going on. And there's many examples we've heard about them going on in the West. But what about the peril, the emergent peril? Well. This risk that I want to talk about is what I've been working on a lot in the last 15 years, uh, or 20, or whatever now, um, is basically is, is climate warming, turns out, has such a strong effect on disturbance processes related to forests that there is risk that it could overwhelm um, our, our forests in many parts of the world. And we'll talk about that local, and I'll actually put it in a global context here as well. The risks. So temperature, particularly here in the southwest, I was part of this effort. Uh, Park Williams, um, this emerged out of his, uh, his uh, dissertation research, but um, the title says it all, temperature as a potent driver of regional forest drought stress and tree mortality. Well, the region we're talking about is Arizona and New Mexico. Um, used tree rings to provide a thousand year perspective, basically took all the tree growth data thousands of trees, hundreds of thousands of measured tree rings from this area in yellow here and um, put together. This is back to 1896 through 2013, no, this would be uh, through 2007 actually is where there was replication of, um, for the initial. And so this is basically the mean tree growth is that line through here. And so low growth, high growth, low growth, high growth. And it turned out that Park could predict tree growth to this astounding uh, correlation coefficient. All right, R squared is of 0.82. Um, regionally, this is um, there's the actual measured tree growth regionally, and the black is prediction of it from just two variables: preceding winter precipitation. And that was no, nothing new there. That's why tree ring dating even works the way it does. Um, is that inner variability. So that was well known, but the temperature signal in non-tree line sites wasn't known before that, not like this. And when you added that together and the strength of the temperature signal, daily max temperature during the growing season, when it's warmer in the growing season, trees grow more poorly. When it's drier in the winter, preceding winter, they also grow more poorly. But that part we know and we know why. Why would temperature during the growing season. Why would a warmer temperature make trees grow more poorly? And it's about half the strength of that signal, a little bit more than half. So the temperature is a strong part of that predictor. And we think what's going on, the reason is basically that <clears throat> when, uh, when it's warmer during the growing season, the atmosphere is drier in this part of the world, in the southwest, and it's just simply the physics. And there's something called the little uh, wonky term there, vapor pressure deficit, is just the unmet demand for moisture by the atmosphere. 
And so it's just the physics of if you take the, the air in this room, this parcel of air, and you warm it up, it can hold more water physically, so it wants to. So it creates a pull on the soil and off the leaf surfaces and needle surfaces of the trees. And that increase is exponential. So with a linear increase in temperature, you get an exponential increase in this unmet demand for moisture. Now, if you're over the oceans, where there's a big pool of water to evaporate, water goes into the atmosphere. So that's why with warming of the global atmosphere, the atmosphere is holding more water, and that's partly one of the things driving the strength of storms and the intensity of precip events. But during dry periods, when the, where there's warming over dry land masses, like the southwest, the, the air just gets drier, and that has a huge effect on the plants. And so they have to close to avoid desiccating to death. How does this affect the growth? Sorry to close the loop. They close the little pores on their leaf and needle surfaces, called stomata, where transpiration, where water is pulled up, which is pulling water literally through the, like the plumbing system of the trees and the xylem out of the soil through the leaf surfaces. And there's tension. It takes tension, like a siphon to get it up there. And when that tension gets too great, these little water columns cavitate, they collapse, they get embolisms in them, and if 50% or so of those collapse around the tree, the tree's gonna die. All the buds and leaves are at the, the outer edge. To avoid that, trees close those stomata under water stress. They do this routinely, it's not that big of a deal, but when you're under extended water stress and those stomata are shut for a long time, you also, that's where the photosynthesis gas exchange happens, CO2 in, oxygen out. So basically, when the atmosphere is hotter and drier, they can photosynthesize less because they have to shut down their stomata to avoid desiccating to death. And it puts the tree into this kind of carbon starvation versus desiccation risk, and it's strong enough to affect its growth. And they're finding this signal all over the planet now. So it affects tree growth strongly. Temperature also has strong feedbacks to fires, die-off mortality, and insects. We won't talk about that in detail, but because of that, it's not surprising that this predictor, this two-factor, winter precip and growing season temperature, put that together in part called it Forest Drought Stress Index, or FDSI. So that predictor, which was designed simply to predict tree growth, which it did so well, also has extremely strong correlations with regionally in the southwest, the area affected by bark beetles is mapped by the aerial detection surveys, and the monitoring trends in burn severity of high and moderate burn uh, severities. Um, so, I'm gonna, so climate has a big effect on forest stress and forest condition and disturbance process in this region as well. So I'm going to go through using um, this combination of the land use history, which is sort of traditionally what a lot of the restoration was responding to, and superimpose on it also climate variability for the last century. So this is that forest drought stress index or you can think of it as tree growth across the whole region, back to 1896, again with the mean value in the middle. So starting there, there was, and these orange bars are going to be dry periods, so below the line was a drought. In the late 1900s, through into the early 2000s, into the early, in the late 1800s, into the early 1900s, there was a nasty drought episode. The surface fire regimes collapsed across the region, by 1900, sometime between 1800, 1880 and 1900, probably due, for the most part, doing to, to livestock overgrazing of the grassy surface fuels. Then there was a wet period, an immense amount of tree regeneration occurred in there, and this was 1910, the big blow-up fire year in, in, a, in the West, particularly the Northern Rockies, that triggered the, the sort of the, the cast the die towards suppression as the policy that we were going to go with Western forests with regard to fire. The 1950s, there was a severe drought in the Southwest. Um, and then in this period from the late 70s to the mid 90s was another wet period, an extremely good period for tree growth. And in that period, these zillions of little seedlings that established in that earlier wet period were able to really um, fully fill the space. And so by the mid 90s, um, early 90s, probably southwestern forests, uh, due to this combination of fire suppression and alternating wet periods that allowed first establishment and then the, the, the filling out, the growth of it, 
Um, we're at sort of the maximum expression of biomass you could get in these ecosystems by this point in time. And really, when you look at this, this is regional tree growth. It was a great place to be a tree in the southwest in that time period. And the ski resorts were happy and the irrigators were happy because there was a lot of winter snow. And then, starting in the late 90s, we went into a dry period, and it really shows up with tree growth. And immediately with that first dry year, uh, the winter of 95, 96, that spring, we started the pop fires that suppression weren't able to get a lid on anymore. And there also started to be a lot of insect outbreak issues and a lot of drought stress-related tree mortality. And that little green dash is my timeline in that landscape. So I showed up here, starting in uh, 82, doing the field work for my master's thesis work. I've been doing continuously field work through there. But for me, it's provided a real interesting perspective of a place because I started in this wet period, been, was reconstructing these kind of historic changes, and then have watched this transition. And I've been working with land managers to try to help them figure out what do we do about this. What does this look like on the ground? Well, the green are forests and woodlands regionally. Um, from 97 to 2002, this was the area affected uh, by bark beetles, um, aerial detection surveys. These are the areas of tree killing fire from MTBS. You put it together through 84 to 2012, it was about 20% of the, of the forests in the region. Um, haven't updated this recently, we should do that. Um, here's a long-term perspective using the same forest drought stress index data set. So this region-wide network of tree rings going back a thousand years in this case. So we were just looking at this last little bit of it. So here we got a thousand years. Um, again, the mean value, so think of this as tree growth um, or drought stress through time. Above the line is wet, below the line is dry. The red is a 10-year smoothing average put through it. The gray lines are the individual years. But if, when you look at the red, you see this oscillation that's been going on. So for as far back as we can reconstruct this, um, you can see that it's been wet and it's dry and wet and it's dry and wet and it's dry, and that's normal. So it's part of the historical variability. It's part of that range of variability. Tree growth and trees have had to go through lots of severe droughts in the past. These are a couple of the big ones. These are ones that are kind of famous. Here's the late 1200s drought that drove the ancestral Puebloan people out of the Four Corners region. So think Mesa Verde. This is the late 1500s, which we until recently have thought was probably the worst drought in the last thousand years. Uh, and this starts to overlap with historical documentation of, um, from the early Spanish period. And here's the 1950s drought, so that mid 20th century drought. And here through 2007 is the drought that we are in now. Here's that wet period. And then this is, we know that, for instance, the 50s, I reconstructed tree mortality from there, and the late 1500s, uh, forest age structures are truncated about 400 years ago. It looks like a lot of trees didn't make it through that drought. We know in the 50s, the lower fringes of a lot of tree distributions uh, died. Um, I mean, we have historic documentation of that. And then, <laughs> this is 2002. And if you look back, this is so an extremely negative forest drought stress index, so negative, you see there's nothing else like it in the record. Okay, so 2002 is an anomaly in this long record. And this is what 2002 looked like on the ground in my landscape. This photo and the next, if I had a quarter for every time these were used somewhere, <laughs> I would be doing something else maybe, I don't know. But because these things, but it, it's because they tell the story so well. I mean, and as, like I said, you just had to be awake, I mean, and be here in this landscape. But this, these are pinon trees dying in fall of 2002, that extreme drought year. And there it is 18 months later after the needles drop. And what's green in there are junipers, one seed junipers that survived. This is what that looks like on the ground. This is a big overnight transformation of this big part of this landscape, and it wasn't just locally in my little Hamas Mountains. This was a regional event uh, with some colleagues. Uh, we published this, and uh, good old Dave Brashear is this colleague of mine who's at the University of Arizona now. He coined this term, global change type drought. Well, what is that? It's a hotter drought. We're just, it's a hotter drought. But it wasn't just pinon trees, it was woody plants all up and down the elevational gradient, and it was shrubs and it was grasses, 
70% of the dominant grass cover in the local woodlands, uh, Blue Grama, died back in 2002 in our landscape. We had two kilometers of line transect documenting this. Um, and it wasn't just in the southwest. It was west-wide in the last 15 years. There's been, this is a, a beetle-centric view of it. Uh, and Barb and Sharon would probably say, well, that's appropriate, but <laughs> it, uh, Barb Benz, but it, um, underlying that is stress. There's been a lot of drought in the West, and it's been warm. We'll talk about that more in a little minute, the signal. But huge areas, 55 million acres in the Western U.S. This is updating it a bit through uh, 2016. Um, so huge areas of tree mortality going on, combination of, of factors affecting it, but underlying the vulnerability of these trees to a significant degree is the drought stress. And it turns out, this is not just a Western North America thing, this is a global thing. So, um, you know, I've been interacting with people for the last, oh, I don't know, close to 15 years now, um, looking at this, and so from Alberta to Argentina to the Amazon to Algeria, you can find examples of these things. And um, anyway, half a dozen years ago, seven years ago now, with uh, 20 colleagues around the world, we put together this first global overview paper, and sort of the bottom line things that come out of this is, one, every forest type, and it's not just dry forest, it's wet forest. This is a, emerging as a major issue in tropical forests. Uh, the Amazon basin has had three once in a century droughts, um, 2005, 2010, 2015, 16, in the last 15 years, okay? What were th once thought to be once in a century droughts. It's turning the Amazon from the biggest carbon sink, pulling carbon out of the atmosphere because of the growth, into probably a source back to the atmosphere in the last 15 years because of the, kind of, because of the amount of mortality that's gone on, particularly in big trees. It's not, it doesn't look like a mountain pine beetle outbreak, however, though. You've got high species diversity. It's individual trees. It doesn't jump out in your face as much, but when people are doing the measurements, they're starting to see it's a big deal, and they're starting to show up in, in satellite measurements now, too. And the second big thing is that we can't actually predict it. So we, we observe that this is happening. Um, we don't have a long record. We don't actually know how much different it is now, at least in many systems. In Western North America and some other places, it's historically unprecedented, the magnitudes. But the trend is not certain. And the big deal is, is that we don't know how much drought and heat stress trees can take, individual tree species, in particular places on landscapes, can take before they die. And thus, we can't predict it, and so it's not well represented in the models moving forward. And I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. But we can see this was sort of the, the big dots um, in the original 2010 paper through 2009, and I've had occasion to update it since. With This is all just stuff in the published literature. Foresters, like you all, are, have many examples. I talk to people all over the planet that aren't published because they're not wasting or spending their time publishing it in scientific articles. But it's all over. So we see this trend, but we don't actually, maybe it's just because we're looking harder. So, and indeed, people have done reviews back previously to this, and, and uh, you know, we know drought kills trees. There's not something new there. So there's a question, is there something really new emerging now or not? Well, is there anything different going on? Well, what's different right now is it's getting warmer. Okay, we know that. And, um, and that, and we're here. This is the, uh, you know, the last, this was instrumental records, right? This is instrumental records of the last 120 years, which is what, about 130 is about what we got good. And of course, 2016 was even warmer, and this year will probably be kind of flat globally. Um, this is Northern Hemisphere, the last thousand years from multiple proxy sources of temperature, um, but, um, this is the famous hockey stick uh, thing, which has been looked at super hard and been revalidated scientifically multiple times. But basically, here's the 20th century, and here's the warming that's going on most recently. Sorry, I'm going to back up once more. Note that this, the really strong signal of warming that we see is starting about 1980. Okay, I mean, yeah, there's, there's, there's been variation going on through time. There was, and it was cooler um, in this earlier period, but this, this is what's jumping out at everybody, and it's particularly um, of interest because the, the oceans are really absorbing a lot of the energy. I mean, the atmosphere, to some extent, is just really reflecting the oceans. 
But this is projection. So here's observed. This is through 2006, I think, the data on this. And then these are projections, all the climate models. And the, for about the last 15 years, the climate models have been really consistent about what they, where they project things, depending on how much greenhouse gas emissions we do. So pick your favorite emission scenario, but that's what these different ones are. This is if we get serious about doing something with energy differently sooner than later. But we're on the fast track right now, and it's moving up that way. And we're seeing big things happening in our forests in some parts of the world here. And we don't know where along this line things, tipping points emerge elsewhere, but we see they happen. So thus the risk. Will more extreme disturbance processes and even just physiological drought stress, the climate envelopes change too much to, to damage, um, to force forests to move into novel situations? And so this fundamental question, it isn't just a Western question, this is a global question. We actually don't really know whether, how vulnerable the world is. And I'll explain a little bit more about that just, again, as context, because I think this is really important. Um, the fate of forests and planet Earth is highly uncertain at the moment, if the climate models are even close to right just with temperature. Even if precip doesn't change for any given part of the world, the warming temperatures have a bunch of effects on trees and disturbance processes. Uh, two years ago, with a couple of close colleagues, we put together this paper. It was an invited paper for the 100th anniversary of the Ecological Society of America. Because of that, they gave us a little bit of space to sort of uh, do what I wanted, and what I wanted to do was do a big review. <laughs> so we, we cited more, I looked at probably a thousand articles, cited more than 400 in the article, and what I was trying to do was look at the spectrum of evidence that because some places on the planet, trees are growing better than we've ever measured them. And for instance, in the Northeast US, people, climate change is kind of low on their list. They're more worried about invasive insect pests and, and things, uh, you know, pol air pollution of other sorts. But, so there's a lot of evidence that things will do well. CO2 enrichment uh, affects water use efficiency, CO2 fertilization. Um, but there's also a lot of evidence showing stress emerging and growth problems in different places on the planet. So I tried to look at it systematically across um, a whole range of factors. And so, and we ended up laying this out in kind of a, a set, of, set of contrasting perspectives. So I don't expect you to look at these. I'm gonna go through them. But the way we laid it out was evidence and perspectives of lesser vulnerability with warming drought in the future, warming temperatures, versus evidence of, ooh, things could be in trouble. So they're all laid out lesser and greater. So I'll go through all 10 of them just super quick. But um, there's observations supporting both perspectives in all of these areas. So in some places of the world, we see robust, robust growth and limited mortality. Tree mortality is common to date. On the other hand, we see growth stress, background mortality, and die-off increasing in other places on the planet. Those patterns, but there's not a great global monitoring network for it, but I think these patterns are understandable, but we don't have great wall-to-wall uh, -wall data yet on it. Temperature, well, what are the effects of a temperature? Some would say the effects are not that great in terms of forest stress, and indeed, one of the flip good sides is the atmosphere holds more water, so precip in some parts of the world is going up and is expected to continue to go up. On the other hand, during drought, the effects of temperature are big. And that's the big deal, I mean, to just jump ahead, that it's extreme events. It's not the average, it's not the mean. That's not what's killing trees. It's the extreme events. You can grow great. During the 1980s, it was a great place to be a tree in the Southwest. Since then, not so much. Um, and sometimes just even a bad year, like 2002. This is the big one in the model, CO2 fertilization and water use efficiency. And basically, with more CO2 in the atmosphere, you don't have to keep your stomata open as long to get the CO2 in. Therefore, you don't have to lose as much water. So in the models, they've built this in that plants, oh, well, temperature goes up, they close their stomata more, but because there's more CO2, they're still able to grow. They still do okay. Um, there's a lot of evidence that that may not be the way it actually works out in the field, at least particularly during severe drought, because then your stomata are closed anyway if it's a severe drought. So anyway, this is a big thing, and it's a major scientific area where people are working now, because that needs to be resolved to improve things. How much can plants adapt? They can adapt physiologically. Plant, trees don't, you don't live hundreds or even thousands of years if you don't have ways to adjust to stress and environmental variability. 
So these, there's many, many diverse processes. We address them in the paper, but, um, but they buffer the stress. On the other hand, those all have limits. You can't push them too far, and, so, and we don't know where those limits are. Um, they can also change your growth form. You can invest more of your growth above ground in leaf area. When water is not limiting, people, trees are competing for light and space. When water is limiting, as you all know, they start losing leaf area, and they end up having to put more into roots. Their trunk growth is less, so they can morphologically change to uh, deal with stresses, but it's also, again, limited for depending on how much, how great the stress grows through time. Genetic variation, well, there's a lot of variability on a landscape. We know some populations are more drought tolerant and sensitive than others. Maybe this is just a selection factor and we can select and, uh, and basically natural selection will work on it. But again, there's limits, there's limits. Um, Species richness and microsites buffer. Basically, the talk we heard about refugia from uh, Crystal is kind of fits within that framework. There's places on the landscape that are still going to be suitable, places that are wet along oceans where the temperature is buffered by the ocean. Those will probably be better longer. But again, eventually that gets overwhelmed if it gets warm enough. Four degrees C is a lot. And that's the trajectory we're on right now in terms of mean conditions, um, if the models are close to climate models. Um, so what does this mean for the future dynamics of forest? Will it be like historical conditions, or is it going to be different? How novel will it be in terms of these kinds of things? Um, the models, what do the models say? Right now, most of the models have, to date have been optimistic about it because of the CO2 enrichment built into the process. But one of the big deals is because we don't know how to kill trees, we don't know how to kill trees realistically in the models. And so mortality is missing. They basically just grow stuff in the models. And as long as there's enough carbon, they're carbon balanced models for the most part um, at broad spatial scales. So anyway, this is an area where modelers are working hard. They're finally, uh, from my perspective, finally starting to really address this. And then maybe management. You talk to people in Europe, they think, well, we're, we're managing our forest so intensely, we'll just plant something different, right? We'll change the genetics, we can do, we can do things. And indeed, we can do that, but in our wildlands in the West, we know that's not realistic. I mean, a lot of what's gonna go on, we're not gonna be able to manage acre by acre. Anyway, this was the grand synthesis. This was my colleague Brashear's diagram, the vortex of tree mortality that incorporates <laughs> all 10 of those processes and, and then some other factors in the middle. If you wanna know more about it, you need to read the paper, but there's, in the end, we're concerned. We think there's a broad underestimation about the vulnerability of the world's forests with warming temperature. So, and there's a number of challenges and we're running out of time, so I'm gonna skip this part of it. So, but I will mention a couple other things that large trees in particular are at risk. There's both theoretical support for this um, and empirical support of it from plot data. We're seeing it around the planet that in these hotter drought events, uh, and to some extent, the simplest way to think of it is if you're a bigger, taller tree, it's harder to get the water up there to the leaves and to the buds to keep it alive. It's a little more than that, but... Um, but anyway, it's particularly new, bad news for some of the biggest, oldest, most iconic, coolest things on the planet, um, old trees. So again, this big uncertainty looms over all this. Oh, and then the really bad news from the Park Williams paper, sorry, um, is that he, he modeled, he took a bunch of, uh, took a bunch, he took uh, three or four, the, the main uh, global climate models, the general circulation models, ran them hundreds of times, and then average them, and so for the Southwest, to see what, because, because the models kick out the two things you need to predict forest drought stress for the Southwest, winter precip and daily max temperature, average monthly, he, so it does that. So it creates, um, and these, by the way, these vapor pressure deficits, you could think of this as max temperature monthly, it's the same, it's almost the same thing. Uh, and we translate it into that atmospheric demand because that's what we think, uh, process-wise is going on. Anyway, precip doesn't change much in the models in the Southwest, but the warming temperatures do, and the atmospheric demand, which causes the forest drought stress index to do something like this. And so zooming in on that, so the black is observed, the red is the model. So this takes us through 2007. There's that threshold of tree killing stress. There's that extreme year, 2002. And what you note is that by um, the middle of the century, if 
the models are at all correct relative to temperature, because it's temperature driving this. It's not, precip didn't change much in the models. By mid-century, we start to reach, on average, uh, levels of forest drought stress in the southwest that are unprecedented in the last thousand years. It's hard to imagine, if that comes to pass, that the forests of the southwest won't be forced to reorganize. In reality, this isn't an average of a bunch of model runs. There's this sloshing of the ocean. The reason for that decadal oscillation is the, the Pacific decadal oscillation. Didn't have time to talk about that. Um, but the news is even worse. There's other people working on this. Our one model was this model. If you compare six different models in a paper that came out a year ago for the Southwest, they all basically show forests crashing by mid-century. And they're using very different modeling techniques. And it's what's driving it is the water stress associated with temperature. And I'm going to need to skip the whole fire part because we're running out of time and give you a chance. But just, you know most of this stuff, is that the forest, I'm, this is the landscape I've been living in. And we're seeing type conversions on broad scales. Forests, the scale of stand replacing fire is seriously out of whack in our part of the world. And we're seeing that things like conifers in that part of the world need mother trees to survive, and they're not. So re-sprouting life forms are being favored. This is an impress paper where we document that the oak shrub fields are long persistent in this part of the world. So once they get established, even without climate change considerations, they're probably not going to change. Big watershed effects, which has gotten society's attention in this part of the world. And... Um, Oh, this is just a little side note that one of the things I think we're still doing wrong because of the concern of these big high severity fires is there's not enough attention to the post-fire rehab. I've been part of multiple bear teams and we are still putting, we put a billion cheatgrass seeds on the Cerro Grande fire and a half billion smooth brome seeds and smooth brome is taking over big parts of the world up there. And we're not, nobody's monitoring, nobody's paying attention to it. And it's, it's one of these things that in the, 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 you know, the legitimate concern over watershed runoff and erosion and loss of soil, we're not looking at the ecological trade-off effects of this. Um, anyway, the fires have been getting bigger, but they're still not as big as fires used to be. We, we <laughs> this whole mountain range was on fire from our fire scar records in the past at times. What matters more as an ecologist is the stand replacing fires. And this is stand replacing fire in the last 15 years in the Hamas. This is, this, this is a million acres, okay? And this red stuff, the forests on the east side of this mountain range have been taken out. For me, I've taken this kind of personally because we could see the risk of this and I've been working with land managers trying to help them get ahead of that curve through restoration processes and, and avert this kind of an outcome. And we demonstrably failed. But it's starting to reach societal tipping points in some areas in this part of the world, so there's good news. There's, there is this question, you know, what are our options moving forward to this in terms of adaptation? Um, but the assertion I would make, and so I'm closing here, uh, Paul, is that the, you know, that the historic range of variability, which has been the target, the reference conditions moving forward is increasingly less relevant in a, in, a, in a climate change, in a global change world. And it's more than temperature. There are other big factors going on too. But, and we're going to increasingly need to anticipate, adapt to, and manage for an uncertain future range of variability. And there's a lot of learning to do, and there's a lot of collaborative learning that needs to be done to, to do that successfully. Um, we could talk more about this. There's a big debate, actually, in the restoration ecology world. You know, the novel ecosystems people threw a big rock in the pond that, you know, that, that is still being dealt with in, in the Society of Restoration Ecology. But I would submit that in the West, I would, that there's, as, and partly as a result of what we're seeing in the West the last 20 years, that there's an evolution recently from restoration toward a historic range of variability target to also incorporating adaptation toward a future range of variability. And that these are convergent operationally to some extent because some of the same things that we want to do, at least in dry forest types in the West, reduce stand structure densities, make the remaining stems more resilient, that's also what you want to do from a climate change adaptation standpoint. And I'll just note, people might want to read this. There was an article in the Annals of the Missouri Botanical Garden in the last year, a, a bunch of stuff about these kind of restoration target stuff. But Don Falk wrote a piece, and he's based in Arizona in the Southwest, 
with Southwest examples, but he, he lays out, he's trying to meld these ideas of how do we deal with the novel tipping point stuff through what he's calling resilience ecology, which has resistance recovery, which is sort of traditional restoration stuff, and then reorganization for the novel ecosystem stuff in the future. But maybe resilify is good enough. Maybe that incorporates it all, I don't know. So, um, my last kind of a few points here, I think that the notion that we want to help ecosystems in the West respond more incrementally. We don't want it to all be kind of catastrophic overnight kinds of transitions, and we need to act with some urgency. Um, but I would note, these are not all catastrophes. All the tree mortality out there, I study the, the sort of the drought stress and related beetle mortality, and people look at this and people flip out when they see the forest turn brown, but a, it's a natural process. This is not all catastrophe, including the big wildfires. I mean, there's places where it's doing just the right thing we want on the landscape. We can work with it. And that's, of course, there's been a lot of discussion about that. This is another kind of a cool paper. In terms of whether you get a tipping point or not, it depends upon the legacies of what's left after the disturbance process. But I recommend this paper by Jill Johnstone. And then one last thing is, is that in the West, we've been managing watersheds for water supply in the valleys, but if we're going to want forests, if forests are under existential threat from growing forest drought stress in the West, we might need to be thinking about managing our forests in ways to keep a little bit more of the water on site for the trees, to increase the resilience of the trees and the forests and all the ecosystem services that we benefit from that. And this paper talks about that a bit. Um, we live with the legacy of Smokey, the cognitive dissonance that this creates, right, sitting on the bench saying that it's his fault <laughs> because that only forest fires can prevent <laughs> forest fires. <laughs> and this is a problem with the public. We all have this problem communicating with them. Um, we <laughs> also have this issue with managed fire. I mean, this idea, we've been, Smokey's quite successful. I mean, it's, it's frightening, these fires, and the idea that we need to put them out. Um, and, but it is important to know that we're all in this together. This was the Los Alamos controlled bird. That's the Cerro Grande fire, right? Who lit that fire? Yeah, where I was based, yeah, the National Park Service, but Smokies, that's, the public doesn't make those distinctions. We're all in this together. We need to be working together. That's one of the hopeful things. There's been so much more of that, all hands. Um, I want to talk, the Rio Grande Water Fund, a very cool example in New Mexico. So. Last two slides, I just want to say there's bad news out there. I think forests are at risk. As we do restoration, we also should be forward-looking and thinking about um, adaptation as part of what it is to what's coming forward. We can't just be looking back. We've got to be looking at what's coming forward. Um, but there are opportunities, and we need to act with urgency and collaboratively, as we all know. We need to keep learning, and even so, we're going to still be surprised. There's a lot of things. Non-linear thresholds in the system that are starting to emerge. So, that's it. Well, even though we're a little over time, we would be remiss if we didn't have some interaction because he literally covered the globe, so I'm sure there's plenty <laughs> of questions out there. So, uh, yeah. let's spend about five minutes on questions and then we'll let you go. Go ahead. You're not all shell-shocked, are you? <laughs> <laughs> right up here. Uh, yeah. I just wanted to let you know that now I'm going to stop listening to your talks. <laughs> you're hoping I change my mind that the science, the science changes. Is that what you're hoping? Yeah, okay. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Leslie was just saying uh, she's not going to listen to my talks anymore. Cause, I presume because they're a downer. Is that the? Yeah, okay. Sorry. Mike. I think it's part of the conversation. I think that that's a great, the, the question Mike asked, should we be thinking about assisting uh, migration and moving, if we're thinking about the future, the, the, we know the range distributions of trees are gonna have to shift if, you know, if we get that kind of magnitude of temperature uh, and climate change. So should we be providing some potential 
getting some seeds, moving things forward, selecting for, for you know, more drought tolerant species in the same range if we're gonna try to keep ponderosa on a site that we think it might lose it, and moving things forward. And those are conversations we should be having. There's not a single set answer to that. People are thinking about those things. But I think, yes, I think those are conversations we should be thinking about, of how to, to provide some options, some, some, some ecological capital on the landscape so when disturbance happens, um, there's something, there's, there, are, there are organisms on site that have the potential to, to move forward. So. I have a question here. So um, on your early slides, the, the, the one century and the, and the ten centuries, um, you, you really focused on drought, but I'm going to flip it around on you a little bit. In, in your graph follows uh, work that I've done in Sierra Nevadas and northern Utah, where the 20th century was among the wettest centuries, and particularly the first 20 years of the 20th century was the greatest sustained wet period. To what effect does that off, not offset? Uh, it, it makes the current drought more dramatic because we've gone through a period of relatively wet. Uh, it does. I would show you something, though, Paul, if I can do it, but I probably can't do it on this thing. It doesn't matter. The, 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 the wet periods, two things. The wet periods are super essential in, in the system, and so in the West, everything from herbaceous plants to trees, um, there's, there's pulses of regeneration during those favorable wet decades. Right? And that's when stuff gets established. So for ponderosa pine, there's two or three of those commonly in a century when you look at the demography of stands back the last 400 years. They're not continuously reproducing. So they're super important from a regeneration standpoint. And, but what happened in the 20th century, uh, there was a set of slides I skipped, but there's, a, there's another cool paper <laughs> that came out in Global Change Biology, and the last name of the lead author is Jump. Alistair Jump, and it's about structural overshoot. And I'm biased because I was part of the group that put it together, but I think it's a cool, um, it, it's, it's a worrisome concept because wet periods, what we see with many of these die-off examples in the world is that wet periods that precede dry periods actually can put you at more risk during the, the dry period, especially if it happens fast because You've got all that above ground biomass that emerged because during the wet period you're competing for light and space and you're growing and the stand densities go up. And then if it turns dry fast, all of a sudden these trees are stuck with all that biomass that they got to sustain. And there's just not enough water to keep, keep it there. And so that's what's happening. Even if there wasn't stand replacing fire, there would still be all this mortality going on being mediated by physiological drought stress in insects because you just can't sustain that much biomass during these dry periods, and the warming temperature is amplifying that stress, and thus amplifying the mortality effects on it. But if it happens fast, and what we see is, again, like the Southwest, the 80s, it was great, great place to be a tree. But that can change really quick, and we're seeing that in other wet places on the planet. And so there are a lot of places that, where water is not limiting yet on this planet for tree growth, the warming temperatures in the temperate zone, right, where we've got a, a growing season mediated by temperature and a cold season where they don't, the warmer temperatures means that the growing season's gotten longer. Fire season's gotten longer, but so is the growing season. And where water's not limiting, that's great for growth. So trees are growing really well in places like that. But it actually can put places like the northeast U.S., for example, at risk if, if they have a really one really bad severe drought season because those plants are not neither uh, historically tuned to it or individually tuned to it. So anyway, if that addresses your thing. One more question. Looking back at your career, when you lost a lot of the forest in your home range, you said, would you do something different? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, the question is uh, that I've been present in this my home landscape during a period where there's been a lot of loss of forest, and would I do something different? Um, yeah, I would take more measurements of some other things, knowing it was coming. We could, there was a lot of cool opportunity, like shrubs, we don't have very good data on shrub responses, we can see them, but in terms of from an applied standpoint, uh, I would have wished, I guess I would have had a better time machine. I mean, you can be, 
You know, when, you, when you're a prophet of doom, nobody wants to hear that stuff. <laughs> but if we'd had, like, photos and, 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 you know, documentation, if we could have told Albuquerque they were going to have to shut their water intakes on the Rio Grande for two months after the Las Conchas fire in 11, we could have got them engaged sooner <laughs> in the collaborative processes. It's taken a lot to get society's attention to these things. And I don't, I guess I would have thought harder about what we could have done constructively you know, to be proactive on the front end rather than to have it um, happen. I would have tried to figure out some ways to avoid these outcomes, but I don't know what that is. So, anyway. Thanks so much. Yep.